I have a very unique privilege this morning. Uh, the other person that uh, met the board uh, is a young lady all the way from Liverpool, England. She's not homegrown uh, in this sanctuary, but she is homegrown to us. Uh, my wife uh, attended, uh, I guess, for 17 years, uh, the bed, all of her life, uh, once Brother Hemus uh, took the work in Liverpool. So she has come up under his ministry, and um, has she has held license in uh the GB and I for several years, and so we felt like that it was the will of God to transfer that ministerial license to uh, Maryland because she's home. Amen. We we've decided that England is home, home, but uh, and Arkansas is home, home for me, but uh, Maryland is home uh, for us. So I have a very unique privilege this morning of uh, bringing my beautiful bride to this pulpit to minister the Word of God this morning. So if you're able, would you greet her? Please receive her in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's thank God for what He's done in this place already. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Father, for your restoration that's been in this place this morning, Jesus. God, for your spirit that's ministered to lives and hearts, Jesus. God, you are so awesome. You are so awesome. I thank you for your will being done in this place today, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Amen. It's a privilege to stand here before you this morning. I thought, wow the weekend of the royal wedding and you get a British preacher. So I guess it's, it's kind of fitting um, with all the festivities that have happened this weekend. Um, but I, f I feel like God has given me something to share with you today. And it's been confirmed by what has happened here this morning. So thank God for that. Um, but before we get into the Word of God, I just want to I want to publicly thank all of you. Um, you've made me feel so welcome. Um, and I, I can't tell you what that means. Um, it was such a, a massive thing for me, leaving behind my home and my family and my church and everything I've ever known. But what a difference when... You come to a place where God's people open their arms and open their hearts and welcome you in. And you've all took care of me and checked up on me and I know you've been praying for me and that will mean more than I can ever express. And I want to publicly thank you for that. Um, and I want to give honor to Bishop and Mother who I love. And yeah, I love them. And to... Uh, David and Angie and their family and all the leadership of Antioch what well, wonderful people to be able to be to work alongside be with and um, I also want to I have to give honor to Brother Hemus and his wife <laughs> because and their family because you know you guys have had me for five minutes they had to put up with me for 17 years. And it's quite a feat, let me tell you. So uh, I want to give them honor. And um, it, was really, it was really having a pastor in my life that, that began to allow God to change and transform me. And once I became submitted and submitted to someone enough who God had placed in my life to let him speak truth in love, and let him guide me and steer me and take me under his wing and show me and that's what he did do and he continues to do and I, I want to give him honor and thank him for that because it really um really really was what 
was the catalyst for, for God taking a hold of me and saying, come on, let's, let's do this. So I give him honour this morning. So if you turn your Bibles to Philippians 4, please. Starting in verse 6. And it says, Be careful for nothing. The word careful there being translated closer to anxious. Be, be, don't, don't take care of anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding. Everybody say all. Shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Thank you, Father. Can we pray together? I'll pray for you. You pray for me. And Father, we submit ourselves to you today, Jesus. God, we yield ourselves to your will, Father. I pray today. Lord, that revelation would move in this house today, God. We know that restoration is here, God. You've already been ministering to us, talking to us, dealing with us, healing us, God. But I pray today, God, that this word, your rhema, Jesus, God, will be mixed with faith today, Jesus, to produce whatever you want to produce inside of us, God. Lord, to be effectual in our hearts today, Jesus, for we can do nothing without you, God. We can do nothing without you, Jesus. God, we need your peace, Father, that passes all understanding, God. We need you, Jesus. God, help us today, Jesus, as we submit ourselves to your will today, Father. In your name, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. And everybody said, Amen. You can be seated. Jesus. So, is it okay if, I just want to give you a little bit of background this morning of um, my testimony and who I am and where I'm from. And because um, I felt like God wanted me to share a particular experience with you and how this word applied and how God really helped me to apply this word so that his peace was in control in the midst of the circumstance that I was in. So is it okay if I'm just a little bit real with you today? And come on, we can, we can let our guard down. We're in church. <laughs> so I was, um, and it's actually, it's actually when I think about it, it's, this actually applies right now for what I'm going through because I've been extremely homesick. And um, yeah, it's, only the peace of God that's getting me through it. I look at Abraham in Genesis 12, and I'm like, okay, God, he left his country, he left his kindred. He went to a place where he was completely out of his comfort zone, and you've seen him through it. So I trust you're going to see me through it, but sometimes I wish I could just, like, teleport Abraham and be like, how, how did you feel, Abraham, when that happened, you know? Did, did you feel homesick? Do you have some days where you missed home? And just see how he kind of dealt with that, went through it, because, you know, it's, it's like Bishop said, these were real people. They went through real experiences. And I think a lot of the time we look at the Bible in light of hindsight, because we know how it ends. But we don't understand that when they were in the middle of it, they didn't know how it was gonna end. So we kind of, we, we take away from the faith that was required while they were in the middle of that circumstance because we, we know how it ended up. But when they were in it, they didn't know. So that gives me comfort when I look at Abraham and I think God took him through it and it all worked out all right. <laughs> so, so I was uh, born and raised in Liverpool and... Um, uh, my grandmother and my family there, a group of ladies. My cousin actually 
received the Holy Ghost, was baptized in Australia, came home. All of my family was Catholic. That's all I'd ever known. And um, he came home and gave them this message. And my grandmother always used to say to me that it wasn't even so much what he said. It was the... It was his countenance as he said it. That's what, that's what spoke and ministered to her was that she saw a transformation in him, in her grandson, that spoke to her life. And she was like, wow, what is this? What's happened to him? So roll the clock forward a, a few months and maybe a year. And my mum, my aunts, my grandmother, they'd all traveled down to a church in London, got baptized in the name of Jesus, were filled with the Holy Ghost, and God began a work in our family. But there was no apostolic church in Liverpool, so they went home, and they... Thank you. So they used to meet in house groups and they didn't have a pastor. So they literally used to just, this is the power of the word of God, okay? This, is, this isn't just a book that we read. This is life. It's living. It has the power to transform. It has the power to change when you apply, change you when you apply it, okay? So they used to open the book of Acts and they'd just read and they'd say, Oh, it says that they laid hands and prayed. So they'd lay hands and prayed. There was people delivered of addiction. There was people, all of my aunts and grandmother never picked up a cigarette again after they received the Holy Ghost. So they, they opened the word of God and my grandmother said, oh, it says they gave offering, they collect tithes. So they didn't have a church, but she used to go around to everybody's house on a Sunday morning. Time to pay, time to pay, time to pay time to pay. It's what they did in the book of Acts. It's what the Bible says. We're going to do it. They, their guidance was opening this book and literally doing what it said. And they began to grow. So I think by the time they looked at a building, it was because there was a bunch of people and it was becoming hard for them to f fit in one flat, one uh, apartment, sorry. Um, yeah, <laughs> one house. So, so they began to look, at a, look for a church building. They began to fast and pray. And um, my grandmother was going past the, the current building that we're in right now, which is still the Apostolic Church of Liverpool. She was driving past and she said it caught her attention. So she went over. There was a workman working on the street. And she said, do you know what the deal is with this building? And it was derelict. The roof was off. Believe me, I remember that. Um, the roof was off. It was moss growing inside. Um, and he said, I think it, it belongs to the council. So next day, she gets on the phone to council. Yeah, it's available, but there's, there's one condition. It's written in the deed that this building can only be used for a church. So she said, okay, so they found an opening. They went in. For three days, they fasted and prayed, anointed the walls, said, God, if it's your will. And here we are, that was 1984. Here we are, 30 plus years later, and that site and that church is the apostolic work in Liverpool. So... That, is, that was my family and how the work came about in Liverpool. And growing up, um, I was born into church. I grew up there. But I think, it's, I think even when you're born into church, there comes a point in everybody's life 
that you have to decide for yourself, even if it's all you've ever known. There's a point, there comes a point in, in you where you have to say, no, I'm going to live this. I'm, I'm going to live this for... I'm going to live this for what the Word of God actually says it is to live this and not just do it because it's obligation and do it because it's tradition and what I've always done. And that's what I craved and that's what I desired. I wanted a, I wanted a relationship with God that was real and that wasn't just because it was what I was told to do. Because let me tell you, that makes all the difference. When you do something just because you're told to do it and you haven't had a revelation for yourself... that makes all the difference. So I craved that. So I began to seek God. And I remember I was a teenager and we were at a youth conference and the preacher was saying, commit your life, commit your life. If you want to not go back from this point and you want to serve God and you feel like you've got a calling to be used by God. So I stood up on the chair, raised my hands, tears running down my face. And from that moment, I felt something inside of me change, completely change and transform. And I received the Holy Ghost when I was a teenager. I was baptized in the name of Jesus. And so I was seeking this relationship and I wanted this real supernatural walk with God. Um, but when I was, the other side of the story is when I was two years old, two and a few months, um, my father passed away. So it was really tragic circumstances and um, there was a lot of things about his death left unresolved for many years. So I found myself seeking for this relationship with God and this, I wanted this real supernatural walk with God. But in my, in my growing up, I, I didn't feel very secure. I had no, I, I didn't have my dad. I had no, I had no way to, re, to relate what a relationship of a father was. I had, I had no memory of him. I had no, I had no, you know, I would raise my hands and say, father, and I would sing and say he was a good father. But I had absolutely nothing to relate that to because I, I'd never experienced it. And what I found was when I was seeking this relationship with God and I hadn't allowed me to give him a revelation of what a good father was, I was perceiving everything wrong because what was correction, I was perceiving as punishment. What was correction and what was God correcting me in love because he is a good father? I was perceiving as punishment because I, I'd never been corrected by a father. I, I didn't know what a good father treated children like. I, hadn't, I, had no, I had no experience to relate that to. I'd never called anybody dad. I'd never, it was, there was nothing that I could compare it to. And I think that's a problem a lot of us have in our lives because our relationship with our natural father or our natural parents was way, 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 way far from what we feel like it should have been or what we feel like we deserved. I'm here to declare to you today that we have a good father. We have a heavenly father who if you would allow him to, he will teach you what it is to receive the love of a father. I, I'd, never, I'd never known what it was like to feel a father's love. I, I didn't have anything to equate that to. And I don't know what your experience is. I don't know what's happened in your life. Maybe your father was there, but he wasn't a good father. Maybe you never felt love. Maybe you never felt, you know, what, what you felt you deserved as a child. And whether we recognize it or not, 
consciously or subconsciously, we portray that. We portray that in our relationship. And I know because it affected me for years and years before I let God give me that revelation and heal that void that I had inside of me. That Because it's, it's built into us to want a father's love. It, it is. It's built into us. It's the way we're designed. And until I let him heal that and show me that he could be everything that I'd ever wanted and more. Until I let him show me that and reveal that to me. You know, I was walking with this skewed, skewed perspective of, of what it was and I was perceiving everything that God was doing in my life in the wrong way. And I thought... You know, because as long as I can remember, since I was a kid, I, I did things to, to make my dad proud, you know, to get my dad's approval. And that's a natural thing to want to do. I'm not saying that's a wrong thing to want to please your father. And, but, but try doing it when he's gone. And you've got absolutely no reciprocation of that. It's a very, 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 very frustrating, lonely pl place to be and to try and live and walk in because, and then I then betrayed that onto God and I thought, I've got to, I've got to prove, I've got to do this. If I do this, I've got to earn his love. If I do this, he'll be pleased with me. You know, I didn't have a revelation of the fact that he was pleased with me because I'm his child and because he's my heavenly father. It wasn't based on what I did. I didn't need to, to gain it. I didn't need to earn it. And I believe there's people in this place today that your relationship with your father, your parents, it wasn't what you wanted. And you don't feel like you got what you deserved. And you feel like you were cheated. And you feel like people who should have been taking care of you and who you should be respecting actually took advantage. And people who you feel like you should have been able to put your trust in let you down. That is not God. That is not God. He is a good father. If you trust him, he's not going to let you down. If you trust him, he's not going to let you down. If you let your guard down and your barriers down and your walls down, he's going to be right there to swoop you up. But he will not violate your will. He is bound by his word to not violate your will. He won't force himself in. But if you in faith believe and trust that if you just open your heart and up enough to let him speak to you and minister to you, he can heal that and he can become the father that you need, the father that you want. So I know when we talk about miracles, a lot of the time we think, I don't, well, maybe it's just me. But when we say miracles or healing, I automatically think physical. I, that's just, I think people need healing. People need a miracle. It's physical, physical in their body. And that tends to be the way our, our mind works. But I can tell you one of the big, biggest miracles God ever did for me was filling that void that I had inside from a child I wanted a father. I wanted a father's love. I wanted a father that I could trust. I wanted a father that didn't matter what was going on around me. I could trust him. And, and he did that for me. And that's the, the biggest miracle, one of the biggest miracles. It changed me. It made me feel secure. It made me feel assured. And God can do that for you today. And if you're in this place and you've never received the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost is the way that he does that because he puts his spirit inside of you. 
God is a spirit. He puts himself inside of you. And his spirit, in his spirit is righteousness, peace, joy. And his spirit working inside of you and you letting it transform and renew and do its work is, can bring that about in your life. And I'm telling you that because I've been there and he's done it. He's done it. And when he put himself up on that cross, it was to give us access to that transforming power, that healing power. That's why he did it, so we could walk in newness of life. We could be transformed by the renewing of our minds. What does that mean? That means that the way that I've thought, what's happened in my life, doesn't have to dictate my future doesn't have to dictate. I can tell you, whatever your circumstances were growing up, whatever you've been through, it doesn't have to dictate your future. If you give God the opportunity, He will give you newness of life. That's His promise. So God had really worked to heal me and transform me. And then about uh, seven or eight years ago, and um, we, because a lot of the circumstances around my dad's death were unresolved, so we ended up having to go to court and go through a court case. Um, and it's technically still a criminal investigation, so I need to be really careful what I say about it, otherwise I might be in contempt of court. <laughs> um, so I'll be careful. But about 11, 12 years ago, I mean, sorry, 2011, 2012, we started to go through this court process and going into it uh, I kind of didn't know what to expect I was like you know they told us it'll probably take about eight months and um, there's a lot of evidence and uh, my father when my father died there was also 95 of the people who died with him um, in a stadium soccer disaster and um, they were crushed to death so there was a lot of evidence and there had to be a hearing for each individual deceased, you know, it was, so going into it, uh, I kind of didn't have any expectations other than it'd be long. <laughs> I just knew it was going to be quite a long court case. And so the proceedings started in 2011, 2014. So three years later, we had all the pre preliminaries, um, we were, they'd built a courtroom because there was no courtroom in England big enough to hold the amount of legal counsel and family that was needed. Um, that's how big of a trial it was. F they told that it, was, it would take eight months from the day that the jury was sworn in until the day that we got a verdict. It was two and a half years. So we're traveling to court every day. Monday to Friday, 10 to 5. We got two weeks off in summer, two weeks off in Christmas. But every other day, there was evidence being heard in court. And that poor jury, when, um, when they gave the verdict, the judge pardoned them from ever having to serve jury duty again. <laughs> you can imagine. A normal, a normal murder trial is two weeks or, you know, six weeks. So I think they came in thinking... Oh, six weeks off work and two and a half years later, they're still there in the dark. It's like, wow. It was the longest running trial in British judi judicial history. There's never been a trial as long as it, and I, I doubt there ever will be. But it was, it was a, an experience, and to say the least. And... I didn't realize when we first went into it and we were, and the strangest thing about this was, and I'm making a point here, I'm not just saying woe is me. I'm making a point because I can only speak about my experience because I can only speak about what God has done for me and what he showed for me. And that's the best way I know to relate it to you. So there's a point to this, but when we, when we initially went into it, I... I didn't really realize at first how it was affecting me. And the strange thing about it was is that we were 25 years on from my dad passing away, so we've all moved on with our lives. My dad's got a great-grandchild now who was born 
during this. So we're in a completely different place in our lives. When we walked into that courtroom and sat down, we were hearing that evidence as if he had died yesterday. So we were, we were constantly in this thing of the past, the present, the past, the present, the past, the present. Let me tell you something. That is no way to live. That is no way to live. If you, if you hold on to your past and you're trying to walk forward in newness of life, there's no peace in that. There's no peace in that. That is the most frustrating six months of my life when I hadn't even realized that I was letting it, letting it get to me. And then all of a sudden, because it, it was constantly what should have been, what could have been, what, and then we were coming out to what actually was. And I'm here to tell you today, we don't serve the God of should have, could have, would have. We serve the God of gonna. We serve the God of gonna. And, and if we're walking through life with what should have been and what could have happened and what would have happened, there's no peace in that. It's gone. It's gone. Don't let it dictate your future. Do not let it dictate your future. God has given us the ability to be free. He's given us the ability to let peace rule and reign in our hearts. And I, I remember one day driving home and I was like, because all of this focus on what should have been and what could have been and it was draining, it's draining. I, I would come out and one day I got in the car and we'd had six hours of it and there'd been forensic evidence, all this stuff. I just drove straight to the church, walked into the sanctuary, walked up to the altar, got on my face and I was like, God, I've got to release this to you. I can't, I, I can't, to, uh, I don't want to carry it. I, it's just, it's not appealing to me. Living in this, living in this turmoil of questions and anxiousness and all these doubts raising up and questions in, in my heart and in my mind. And I got on my face and began to pray. When I finished praying, God brought to my mind a message that I'd preached in Liverpool a little while before. And the title of that message was let peace be your umpire. And I was like, that's it. I'm not letting peace. I'm not letting peace do its job. I'm not letting the Holy Spirit that's inside of me. I, I was just kind of going in there passive and letting all of this stuff, you know, flood. And I thought, I'm... I'm not letting peace be my umpire. And the context of that message was in Colossians 3, when it says, let the peace of God rule. But in the Amplified Version, in parenthesis there, it says, act as an umpire. So what does an umpire do? Well, I love Wimbledon. Anybody here like tennis? Yeah, I love Wimbledon. There's an umpire in tennis. Um, I believe there's an umpire in baseball, but I haven't been to a game yet. And um, Oh, sorry, I have been to a game, but it was cancelled <laughs> last week. We were like, oh, go O's. Oh, rain delay. Oh, cancellation. So I haven't, I haven't been to a baseball game yet, but I believe there's an umpire in it. And um, I'm looking forward to embracing American sports. I don't really have any other option being married to the man that I am, I don't think. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I love tennis. Wimbledon, every year. I was actually quite annoyed because the week that we got married, Wimbledon was on. And I was like... Oh. <laughs> I was like... Oh, honeymoon and... Wimbledon's on. <laughs> Sorry, babe. 
but I do love Wimbledon. I love tennis. And um, there's an umpire in tennis. And what's the, what's the job of the umpire? The umpire has authority of what goes on in that court. The umpire, as will probably be the same in baseball, has the, has the authority to eject anyone from that field, anyone from that court, that doesn't that he deems is not within the rules of the game. In the same way, peace. Any thought, any feeling, be anxious for nothing. Anything that tries to take residence in your mind and your heart, peace has the authority to say, hold on a minute, that's not in the Word of God. Hold on a minute. Let me eject that from here. That has no place residing in the heart of a child of God that is filled with the Spirit of God, that is submitted to the Spirit of God. Let peace be your umpire. Let me ask you a question. Can we have peace when we're in control? We think so. Good answer. It's impossible to have true peace when we haven't relinquished control. Bishop preached it. The flesh profits nothing. It's the spirit that quickens. And the spirit is life and peace. So it's only when we relinquish control to allow the spirit of God to be governing our spirit, governing our lives governing us, that peace has the ability to be the umpire. You know, it's like Romans 8 says, to be carnally minded is death. But the spirit is life and peace. It's impossible when we're in control. You know, and we wonder, we wonder why we're walking around in turmoil. What's in control? Have you relinquished control? And I, I completely get it. It's, it's, it's difficult sometimes. You know, the passage says, we, well, maybe it's just me, but I take to thought so many things that I should actually take to prayer. You know, God, God I, I, did it, I did it with our visa process when I, I didn't know how long before I was going to be here. God, I give you this. God, I give you this. I relinquish control. Then I was on Google. How long for a U.S. visa to be processed? God, I give you this to you. God, I give you this to you. Wait in times for the Baltimore field office for visa What was I doing? I was supporting my own understanding. Like it says in Proverbs, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. Lean means give support to. What was I doing? I was trying to rationalize. I was trying to say, okay, it'll be three months. It'll be three months. I hadn't fully given over control to allow God to say, you know what? The circumstances of it don't even really matter. Because I'm going to give you peace to be content in whatever, it. however it turns out. It. I'm going to give you peace to be content in that. So I stopped the Googling. Because you know what? Ultimately, I might have wanted it to be in two weeks. But if God's will wasn't two weeks, why would I want that? Why would I want that? Because, that, because his plan is best. His will is best. He's a good father. He knows what he's doing. And thank God, because the time that I was in Liverpool that we were waiting, God did some things and it, it was God's will that I was there and I wasn't here, as tough as it was. But we, that's what we feel we have to do. God, I, I give you this, I give you this. But we don't actually fully relinquish control of it. So... 
So Philippians 4, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, like we just spoke about, with thanksgiving. So thank God, no matter how it feels, no matter what's going on, let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That word keep there. Have you pulled up your Bible app and click the Strong's word? That word keep there means, oh, oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Woo! That word keep there means to set a watchman in advance. As in a garrison, as in a centennial, which is setting a soldier up to look out for what's coming. So not only is he giving us peace for what we're coming through, but going through right now, but if you let peace do what peace can really do, it's looking out for what's coming in the future. And you know what we do when we don't relinquish control? When we don't relinquish control to God, to the Spirit of God, you know what we're doing? We're saying to those soldiers, stand down. We're saying to those soldiers, you, you can go off duty for a bit and take, break, take a break. And there's absolutely no protection as to what goes on in this mind and this heart and the the doubts that are raised and the questions that are raised and the turmoil that's raised is absolutely no. You can, you can take a break. I've got this. That's what we say when, when, we, when we take thought of things for ourselves and try and rationalize it and try and figure a way out and through it instead of just trusting God and allowing peace to do its work. And that's why we've got to seek peace. It, you know, every day I seek peace. God, I seek peace because I, I seek peace for, for whatever your will is today. And that's something that we can't be passive about that. It's something that we've, you know, it's like in Proverbs 25, I believe, when it says that, a spirit with no control is like a city without walls. And when I, when I looked at the definition of what it means to, for peace to keep your heart and mind there, I thought, wow, it's exactly it. If, we're, if our spirit isn't under the governance of the Holy Spirit, we're not under the governance of, of God's spirit, we're wide open. I hope you've been okay with me sharing a little bit of my testimony and experience today. Can we pray? If you're in a situation right now and you know that you're anxious, you know that even though you know God's, God is peace and God's given you peace and we have the ability to have peace that passes all understanding, you know that in your mind you're still trying to, you're still trying to navigate your way through and rationalize and you're wondering why you've been feeling so much turmoil. I believe that God wants to restore peace today and give peace. And God wants to break strongholds in minds of things that we've allowed in that had no authority to be there in the first place. Oh, no authority. But because we haven't let peace act as the umpire within the parameters of this word and within the parameters of his spirit, then we've let doubts and fears and anxiety, things take a hold. 
Would you begin to pray today? And if what I said earlier, if you're longing for a relationship with a heavenly father, but you've never known what it is to feel that relationship, the Holy Spirit today can help heal you and minister to you. And God will, if you give Him the ability to, He will show you that He can be that Father that you've always wanted. We pray right now. If there's somebody around you who's praying, would you go pray with them? Lay hands on them. Let the Holy Ghost use you to minister this morning. Come on, I don't believe God's done with what He wants to do. Help us today, Father, by your grace, Jesus. By your grace, God. Help us, Jesus. God, when our mind's clouded with anxiousness, Jesus. Doubt, God, because we don't we don't see the end of the process that we're in, God. We don't see what's happening in this season. I pray today, God, that we would allow your peace, Jesus. to act as that umpire, God, in our hearts and in our lives, Jesus. I pray that we'd open our heart to you today, Jesus. It was a willing heart to receive your word today, God. What you have for us, Jesus. I pray for anybody in here today, God, that's been hurt by their father, God, that Things happened in their upbringing, God, that it's painful, Jesus. We struggle to trust God. I pray today by the authority of the name of Jesus, your spirit would minister that they would be, begin to open their heart and faith to allow you to restore, to allow you to change their mind, transform their mind in the way that they're perceiving you, Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ. Yolo Mahanda Satarayata. Yoro Mahanda Satarayata. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Yoro Mahanda Raye. Thank you, Jesus. Yolo Mahanda Raye. Help us to trust you today, God. Not to lean to our own understanding, Father. To trust you completely, God. For your will, Jesus. God. God, let us not listen to the voices, Jesus. Like we heard this morning, God. Not to listen to the voices of doubt and fear and anxiety and shame, guilt, and grief, God. But that we would understand, Jesus, that in your spirit is righteousness, peace, joy, God. Life, everlasting, Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Come on, if you don't feel like you need to necessarily pray for yourself, would you go and find somebody who's praying? Join with them. Thank 
you, Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you for your word today, Father. Thank you, Jesus. And minister into our hearts, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Yora Mahanda Satarayete. Yora Mahanda Sierra Mahondo Rayata. Yolo Mahanda Satarayata. That's it. Open your heart today in faith. That's it. Open your heart today in faith. We trust you for your peace, God. Hallelujah, Jesus. God, I pray that we would have a revelation of your peace keeping our hearts and our minds, Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, in the name of Jesus. Yes, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, let him go a little bit deeper this morning. Come on, can we allow the Holy Spirit to begin to minister through us? Come on, open your heart to him, he's here. If you've never received the gift of the Holy Ghost, He's here. It's available to you today. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. That's it. Come on. Can we have everybody praying right now? In the name of Jesus. That's it. Come on. His spirit's moving. Yes, Jesus. Come on. If you know you've been holding on tight you're wondering why you feel so frustrated there's so much turmoil let him take control we can't do this in our flesh our flesh profits nothing but his spirit quickens let his spirit quicken this morning in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, come on, your future doesn't have to be dictated by your past. Your future does not have to be dictated by your past. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, the Bible says that we are to eschew evil, or shun it, but we are to seek and pursue peace. Come on, right now, would you just pursue peace? Say, how do I do that? Why don't you stand to your feet, lift your hands toward heaven, and with your voice, your mouth, begin to pursue peace. Hallelujah. Come on, young man. Come on. 
in the name of Jesus, that's it. Just lift your hands toward heaven and pursue peace. Ha. In the name of Jesus, that's it. Yeah, thank you. Ha -ha. Come on, let the Holy Ghost move in this place right now. Hallelujah. 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 Brother Prasad, Brother Prasad, would you pray with her right here? In the name of Jesus. Come on, the Holy Ghost is moving in this place right now. Can you be sensitive to those that are around you? Hallelujah. 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 In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Father, we lay down our past. God, we lay down every feeling of rejection. God, we cast it, Lord. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, God, we lay down every disappointment. In the name of Jesus, God, we lay down every feeling of rejection. In the name of Jesus, God, we seek your peace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The name of Jesus. Ha. Come on, God's doing some deep things in this place right now. He's a good father. Trust him. He's a good father. Trust him this morning. Hallelujah. Trust Him not only with your future, but with your past. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. 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 Yes. Yes. In the name of Jesus. My, my, my. In the name of Jesus, come on. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. God, we believe. Believe in your love, God, in your power to deliver, in your power and ability to make all things new. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. 
Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Atola la mandolo lo cosi andolo lo brama. Hallelujah. We're not going to dismiss this morning. Just as you're ready to leave, you're welcome to leave. We're going to remain in a spirit of prayer with what God is doing here this morning. In Jesus' name, in the name of Jesus, please, please don't rush out. Continue to pray. Continue, continue to seek the Lord. Hallelujah.